the other panelists. So internationally, there's the idea that free market capitalism is uh, not to pick on the French today of all days, but as they like to say, an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon. But if you look at the countries that actually have a great deal of economic freedom, there are places like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, South Korea, they're not exactly a club of Anglo-Saxon Protestant countries. How does that affect how we talk about it? Well, um, I guess I am the, the Latino component here in the, in the session. We have our uh, black friend, yellow friend, I am the brown friend, and you are the white friend, I guess, in the, in the mix. Um, it's Muslim. Yeah. I originally come from Venezuela, and Venezuela actually is going through a terrible crisis, really horrible situation. Actually, I invite you for a panel we have on Latin America also in the afternoon. But uh, I have been living in California. California is a very multi multicultural society where there are people from everywhere. And so I haven't found much racism in, in several of the areas of California, but obviously there are races everywhere, and one has to be very aware of that situation. But also in Latin America, where I am originally from, there is even more racism for that matter. Okay, so maybe because there is less freedom or less uh, liberty in many ways, or how can you express yourself? So this is a problem not just in the USA, this is a bigger problem in other societies, as you were mentioning. And I think this is a, a very important point to consider when we talk about these difficult issues. Um, and um, I think the situation can improve, obviously, uh, because the world is becoming more and more globalized. And if we keep our freedoms, if we trade, if we have a lot of commerce with other people, that actually, I think, decreases the, the issues of uh, different uh, races, different peoples. Um, and uh, that is why I, I am so much in favor of free trade and uh, uh, libertarian ideas in general. I think going back to the original, the original question is we, have a real, we do really have a brand. We have a horrible branding problem in the Libertarian Party, and part of it is the fact that any Tom, Dick, and Harry can just call himself a Libertarian, or the media can call any Tom, Dick, and Dick, Larry a, a Libertarian, and nobody seems to know the difference. You know, you, the, Glenn Beck can go on television and call himself a Libertarian, and then advocate for anti-Libertarian positions on a daily basis on his radio show, and people who don't know about us don't realize he's not libertarian. They just take him at his word and decide, oh, well, you know, CNN told me that Rick Santorum was a libertarian, so <laughs> he must be libertarian. And I, that's one of our big problems, is that we don't have the ability to control the narrative about our own philosophy, about our own ideas. Uh, and I think that's a really big problem. We've kind of been made into the, the party of old white men, the, the richer, more prejudiced version of the, the GOP is what most minorities that I've spoken to that are on the left feel about libertarianism. And part of that is the fact that we aren't vocal enough in pointing out that these people who are wearing our label don't deserve it. They, they, don't, they don't follow our values. They don't believe in our philosophies. They advocate for government intervention. They advocate for the theft of, of property by the state so long as that property is used in a way that they approve of. They literally advocate against libertarian values and are labeled as libertarians while they do so. And I think as a community, you know, white, black, Muslim, Jew, Christian, as libertarians generally, we have to find a way to fight back against the mainstream media labeling people who aren't libertarians as libertarians. And as far as on the international stage, uh, what I've done, at least in my own community, is we have to find ways that these things relate to these people. Uh, I have a show, uh, an international radio show called, called The Call to Freedom. And what we do is we bring on some of, the some of the most renowned and contemporary Islamic scholarly, and we discuss libertarian philosophy with them for two hours on live radio. And then we broadcast that via satellite to a geographic region that's home to about 300 million Muslims. So we're bringing people that the Muslim community respects and discussing libertarian philosophy with people that they have a respect and an admiration for their opinions. And out of that, we've got the founder of the first Islamic university in the US saying that, basically quoting Bastiat, saying that you as an individual and the state as well are no different. 
that if I steal from the man standing next to, sitting next to me, it's no different than if I give 20 people the authorization under the name of statehood to make that same theft. Theft is theft. Uh, you've got Yasser Khali, the first, uh, the founder of the first Islamic um, seminary school in the United States, saying that according to the majority of Islamic scholars throughout history, the state has no right to your money. And these are messages that we're, we're, we're broadcasting out to a specific audience, and we're bringing people that they relate to. So if you wanted to, to deal with an Asian audience, I wouldn't bring you know, G Gary Johnson. I would bring Lily, because Lily can relate to them in a way that Gary can't. And that's another issue I think that we have, is we, as, as he put it, we've got southern old white guys trying to do the outreach to minorities that they don't really have any cultural understanding of the people that they're trying to reach out to. They have like a cursory understanding, most often based on stereotypes, but no actual cultural understanding. And until we're able to bridge that gap, which I guess is part of the reason for this whole event, we're all we're going to keep coming to that disconnect. We're going to keep coming to that wall where we're basically speaking two different languages to each other, and we're not. We may both be speaking English, but we're speaking two completely different languages philosophically to each other, and we're not understanding each other. Until we get past that, I really don't see us solving the issue with the branding in the Libertarian Party. Yeah, on the branding thing. Um, part of the problem is you have a Libertarian Party, you know, small L Libertarian, such as myself. Party. And you've got people who are basically populist conservatives who are too angry to call themselves Republicans or otherwise. <laughs> 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 so you get I, uh, this phenomenon on Twitter of people who identify themselves as libertarian nationalists. The hell does that even mean? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of how they work. <laughs> kind of confusing in a way, but um, we do spend a lot of time talking about how we talk about things which uh, brings me to the second subject I wanted to get to. Uh, not the best year for race relations in the history of the United States. Uh, maybe not the worst, but uh, it's certainly not the best. And I think this actually presents libertarians with a, uh, a kind of interesting problem, which is the libertarians have always, well not always, but historically largely been people who are fiercely individualistic, who take a very, very individualistic world of how we relate to one another in society, and many of whom would consider the fact that we're even having this discussion kind of a moral failing because we're talking about people in racial groups and ethnic groups and those sorts of things rather than as individuals. I myself don't, don't share that view, but it seems to me that it's been recapitulated in a sort of very specific way with Black Lives Matter of this very funny argument about how we talk about things and people saying our slogan should be Black Lives Matter versus people saying no, we should say all lives matter. Uh, because we want to see people as members of the human race and as individuals, not as members of racial groups or ethnic groups or whatnot. But of course, the reality is that people are both of those things. And I think this presents people with our views with a particularly difficult set of circumstances to negotiate. So I appreciate everyone's thoughts on that. One of the issues that I've run into uh, with my African American friends, I'm African American as well, is we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, they don't like to hear you say All Lives Matter. And it's, man, it's always been difficult for me because I believe that you should be able to say All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. But the happenings last week, you kind of had to look at the fact that it was a real issue. It could happen to me. Um, Philando Castillo, Austin Sterling, uh, I could have been in a car and somebody shot me because they thought I was reaching for something. You know, those type of failings we have to address them. And Black Lives Matter, I believe that they should be paid attention to, and I believe that we should definitely listen to what they have to say, but they need to come with some real organization. I think that's what's lacking currently. What do you think the libertarian response to this issue should be? How should we be talking about it? What sort of policy ideas should we be bringing up and saying, you know, this is how we should go forward on this? I think that we should focus on strong points like civil asset forfeiture, um, ban the box, so you're not talking about, so you go to jail and you get out and you gotta say that if you commit a misdemeanor or a felony, we should talk about things that directly affect them so that they can potentially improve. Most libertarians agree with the fact that civil asset forfeiture is horrible. You know, um, drug charges, you know, like current iteration, that's horrible. I think, and I've had some success with this, is explaining it to him, they was like, well, I really like Rand Paul, but I never thought about it because 
he's kind of an old white guy. I was like, well, he's not actually not that old. That's what I always say. You should give him a listen. And so, <laughs> so you know, not trying to crack those, but that's actually what I say. So when you get to that point, they pay attention to that. Um, those type of things work. We need to work on criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform is one issue that libertarians and Black Lives Matter can definitely connect on. But we have to walk and talk to them. We have to go up to them. They're not going to come up to us. Well, when, I, when I'm out there, I, I think that, uh, um, of course, I'm, I'm not going out there to um, um, cause conflict at the beginning, then they won't listen to you. So I think that you have to acknowledge their concerns are valid. Um, racism does exist in U.S. Even the U.S. Senator Tim Scott recently came out to testify. He was profiled racially several times just because he's a black. And he's a U.S. Senator. They just did not know that. And they stopped him, putting him over. So, and they do ask me, Lily, have you ever been discriminated come to this country with your strong accent, you look yellow? And I say, well, if I was discriminated, I probably just wasn't too sensitive to notice. I would just push back, attack back, and stand up for myself. Um, but I do try to have a conversation, and also, after I listen to them, I think I will uh, try to get into my argument, like every individual life matters. I will tell them my personal story, that I'm from China, and it's government strategy, it's their agenda to divide their citizens on purpose. Uh, we were classified by Mao, 10 classes of Chinese citizens, five red and five black. So we're busy fighting among ourselves. But at the end, we all lost to a tyranny, total tyranny. They divide and conquer us all. So I'm going out as libertarian candidate. I always try to be the uniter, not divider. And it, I say, I don't look at you, skin color. I don't uh, care your accent. I don't care about your religion. We all are 99% of Americans who want freedom, who want prosperity, who want our children to achieve American dreams. That's something I focus on. And, and, and uh, the roots of problem they see with the Bruce, like the, the police brutality, we have to look at roots of problem. It's really the drug war has been going on for years. And uh, they led the militarization of the police and uh, the low lock um, swap teams, and, you know, going to properties, killing innocent dogs and kids and people, and their civil assets for features. Then you look at the incarceration rate is highest in the in country in, in America with uh, uh, 50 percent of people are the um, basically nonviolent criminals due to drug charges. The white people and black people have same kind of drug abuse rate, but the whites, three fourths of them in the prison, are the blacks. I mean, there is a room for judicial reform to ending the drug war, to treat the drug issue as addiction, health, medical issue instead of criminal issue. When you talk about judicial reform, actually, then you have a common ground with uh, uh, those people who belong to Black Lives Matters. Then slowly you switch to all Lives Matter subject, but you have to, I think, uh, build up um, common ground at the very beginning so they can listen to you. Otherwise, they're shot. It's like you're out of picture. So that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I thought uh, Senator Scott's <clears throat> observations on what happened to him as a black senator were 